Well, morena koutou katoa. Today I am announcing that I am running for the co-leader of the Green Party of Aotearoa New Zealand. Times are tough, but they do not have to be. I want everybody who is listening to know that it is all of us who get to choose our future. If we find our common ground, organise and make our dreams a reality. We've done that twice, against all odds in my home and community of Auckland Central. And now we've done it in Wellington Central and in Ongatai too. We know that we are in the middle of a climate, inequality, biodiversity and housing crisis. All of these are interconnected and they didn't happen overnight nor did they happen naturally. These crises are the direct result of decades of political decisions that have prioritised the vested interests of a few, looking to extract exorbitant profits over the needs of people and planet. Those decisions have always been delivered with an air of inevitability. They have been dressed up in slogans about the so-called balance that we have to find between environmental fundamentals necessary for life on Earth and so-called good economic opportunity, as our new Prime Minister put it so callously this Tuesday at Question Time. But this trickle-down, climate-shredding economy is man-made, and it can and it must be remade. This time last year, we were in the thick of clean-up efforts with the Auckland anniversary floods. Cyclone Gabrielle was yet to hit. And we saw what worked. It was the community. Neighbours helped neighbours. Marae and community hubs opened their doors. There wasn't means testing nor arbitrary assessment of who was deserving. Resilience was once again proven to be a community trait, not a commodity that one can buy off of the shelf. Now I've got to tell you, there is far greater leadership out there in the community than I believe that there has ever been contained within the halls and walls of supposed power. That power running through the veins of everyone in this country is where this place gets its hope of legitimacy from. And the people in here forget that at their peril. I am a proud member of the Green Party of Aotearoa New Zealand because we understand this to our very core. We understand that to confront the crises of our time, it is going to require cooperation at a scale unlike we have ever seen before. We understand that the necessary transformation of our economy and of our systems isn't going to come from top-down vested interests that this government represents. So after conversations with all of my caucus colleagues, party members, family and friends and many people that I admire and respect, I'm stepping up. And I am asking everyone across this country to realise their power to do the same. Because bad things happen when good people stand idly by. This government has a clear, cruel agenda. Whether it's attempting to rewrite our history and trample the rights of Fung the Fenua, pouring fuel on the fire of the climate crisis, or knowingly magnifying inequality, I see no plan whatsoever for a unified, happy, green, Pacific nation at the bottom of the world. But I do see that imagination, that potential, and the seeds of that vision every single day in our communities. I have contributed to our movement as a hard-working, researched radical who wants a livable planet, wealth tax, rent controls, healthy rivers, and a guaranteed minimum income for all. In Auckland Central, we have mobilised campaigns of thousands to win the personal mandate for those ideas in an electorate with a majority National Party vote and a majority Labour Party vote, where we were behind in all of the polls. And both times we have grown the Green Party vote and we will continue to do so. I've also proven my ability to work with people across the aisle, to grow our movement and to change hearts and minds without compromising on values. Whether it's extending protection in the Hauraki Gulf, creating a fund for candidates with disabilities in general elections, saving Tamaki Makoto's iconic St James Theatre, regulating student accommodation for the first time, protecting urban trees, legalising drug checking, or organising to get through COVID-19 and climate change charge weather events. I have proven that we can not only mobilise, but win concrete change. So today, I am announcing that I want to do that at scale, alongside Marama Davidson as co-leader of the Green Party of Aotearoa New Zealand. We will grow our green branches and provinces across the country to run local campaigns and implement local solutions above and beyond the election cycle. 
We will support local champions who embody our kaupapa and elect more Greens to local government at next year's local body election. We will continue to grow our Green Party caucus as the leading movement of the political left. And ultimately, we can lead government. Just over six years ago, I stood in the chamber and delivered my maiden speech. I said then and there that if I could accomplish one thing in my time here, I want to change people's awareness of what politics really is. Because if we can change that, then everything else can change. I wanted to ask people to look critically at the reality around us, to look at our culture and our society and our economy, and to ask ourselves if those systems are just and fair. And if not, who profits from that unfairness? And who pays the price for that injustice? So this year, as with every year since 2016, it is my job to work to remind people of our shared power to organise our communities to transform our world. No one person can do this alone. So mark my words when I say that we are going to build the biggest green movement that any of you have ever seen. And we are going to change our world for the better. Because after all, grassroots organisation like that is the only thing that ever has. Any questions? You've consistently well, you said that you didn't want the job. Sorry. You've consistently said that you didn't want the job. Why the change? Look, I came here to represent my communities, and I have spent the last few days talking to my communities, talking to my caucus colleagues, and talking to those in my community who I admire and respect. And they've asked me to stand up. As I've just said, I'm also asking all New Zealanders across this country to reflect on their talents, their skills, their experience, and their capacity to step into their power and to stand up too because the necessary transformation to meet the challenges of our time is not going to come from one person. You've Are you confident you, you can pass you, you said you want to be, uh, this is, you want to lead government essentially, meaning the Greens will be around the ministerial table, not just in confidence supply, but leading the government. That's a hugely ambitious task. Mm -hmm. Do you have what it takes? How are you going to get there? We're going to get there by continuing to grow our green movement. We have consistently demonstrated that we have the capacity to attract incredible talent to our ranks with a range of experience out there in the real world. We will continue to attract that talent to our ranks. We will continue to grow our Green Party caucus, and we will command that power inside of Parliament at some point in the future. That's the point. That is what I am here to do. I have demonstrated my capacity over the last several years to contribute to building that movement, and we will continue to do that. But to do that, you're going to have... That, where do you see the Greens' relationship with Labour going? Because when you've been in government, it's been with Labour as the major party, so how will that work? Look, I think it's abundantly clear to any New Zealanders out there that the legacy parties are just that. They do not represent the future of this country. I am in the Greens because I strongly and vehemently believe that our future involves us confronting the dual crises of climate and inequality. And we've proven and we've shown as the Greens that we are putting forward evidence-based policies that reflect the values of most New Zealanders, and we will continue to do so. Are so you running out of post? Did you have the support of all of your caucus colleagues? Did you seek that before putting your name forward? As I've just said, I have spoken to all members of our caucus, all of our MPs, uh, but it is not my place to divulge private conversations. Do you, you, can you describe yourself as a radical in, in your speech? Do you see that as in any way alienating sort of more in the centre-left of party membership or people you're trying to appeal to? I describe myself as a research radical, um, and it will come as no surprise to anyone here that I really do do my research, that I really do uh, value about myself, that I seek to put forward evidence-based solutions. And, you know, I will argue and debate with anybody on the propositions that we put forward. Okay. I very strongly believe uh, that the Greens are the leading left-wing voice in our parliament. Uh, when it comes to, I guess, describing oneself as a radical or otherwise, I believe that radical and uh, ra radical change at this point is necessary uh, to confront the challenges of our time. Tinkering will no longer meet that threshold. Are you running unopposed? I think up being you as a politician in terms of the extra responsibilities that you have to take on. Uh, look, I have spent the last six years uh, working within our communities to organise to meet challenges at a really local level. Uh, I am excited by the prospect of being able to do that with our Green Party members in branches and provinces across the country. Uh, but I'm also really excited to do that at scale with the Honourable Marta Davidson. So what it looks like in practice is actually just holding a mirror out to our communities and saying that, you know this thing of inspiration that we so frequently bandy about in terms of leadership or otherwise? Well, it's not an individual thing. It is not a reason to put somebody on a pedestal. In fact, inspiration is a mirror. It is members of our community seeing in themselves uh, something that they admire about. How, how do you ensure that the Green 
the green party caucus goes well. I mean, we've, you've had the list of Kitty Kitty last year, Goldie's already this year. How, how are you going to ensure that you work well as a team, that you know, the green party thrive? Uh, we do that by reflecting on our values, as I hope that all political parties do frequently. Uh, we do that through consistent uh, movement building. We do that through regularly uh, doing our utmost to meet the challenges of our time by organising and by galvanising, by reflecting on the evidence, but also by building that team. And we have, as James said on Tuesday, an incredibly fresh-faced caucus. We have a group of people with diverse experience and skills who have come to this place to represent their respective communities. So it's going to take time to bid that in. Uh, but I'm really excited as I look around our caucus table at the talent that we have. James if, called if, himself... If you are successful, you'll succeed, James Shaw. Mm. Have you given any thought to how you would like to lead the party differently to James? Mm. So is this going to be a continuation, mm. different style, different policy? What will change? Uh, so I think, you know, as you look around this room, you'll see Rod and Jeanette uh, Tong um, framed up behind us. You'll also see two of our different iterations of relationships with Labour uh, and government over the last six years. Uh, and I think you'll also reflect on the fact that every single one of our co-leaders who've led us in the last 30 years that we've been a formalised political party have been different from the other. Uh, I really admire about James the fact that he is a consensus builder and that he has managed to win concrete change that has survived a change of government. Uh, what I bring to the table is not only that consensus building, but also I think that capacity to mobilise our communities, as I've aptly demonstrated in, for example, Auckland Central. Given well, the fact that you want to lead the first Greens government, can we say that you want to be Prime Minister? This isn't about me, Jason. It's about the movement. It is about all of us working together to get to that place where we have the strong green movement necessary to implement that policy. But you'd be at the head of that movement, which is the Prime Minister's job. I think you'll find that I'm running for the co-leadership, so not you'd be for me myself. A co-Prime Minister, then? You want to be co-Prime Minister? I'm not interested in positions in much the same way that I've foreshadowed with all of you here. Yeah, I've been asked to do that by my communities who I represent, and I am asking all New Zealanders across the country to reflect on their power, to step into positions positions where they too have the opportunity to lead, because that capacity for leadership I think is pretty ill-defined actually by what we frequently see with political party leaders in here. What right. Davidson um, wasn't able to commit to a full, the full, um, full term, committing to a voting how does that sort of factor into any of your decision making? i got to uh, say that I understand that that was potentially a bit of a uh, misunderstanding uh, as far as I am aware in the conversations that I've had with Marama is that she will be leading us to the 2026 election. Okay. What's, your, what's your relationship with Marama like and how would you two work together as co-leaders? Ma, Marama and I uh, have a wonderful working relationship as I have had with her as my boss for the last five or six years uh, and obviously I've had uh, ongoing uh, all with her about what this may look like but again it's not my place to divulge those private conversations. What co are you particularly keen to progress? One of the things that I love about this party and why I'm a member of the Green Party of Aotearoa New Zealand is that we, to our core, understand how deeply interconnected the issues are that we are facing. So frequently we will see some really reductive and misinformed analysis seeking to separate the Greens on the basis of the environmental and the social wings. That fundamentally misunderstands who we are. It was Jeanette Fitzsimons who said that we have an economy that exploits both people and the planet. So what I'm excited about representing is our Green Party co -papa. It's why I came to the Greens, because we understand that in order to solve the crises of our time, it's going to take all of us and it's going to take complete systems transformation. You'll also be the youngest co-leader ever and part of the first female leadership duo. How, does, how proud does that make you? <laughs> I think my dad's probably pretty good with that, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, at the back. Um, you talked about uh, James Shaw's legacy around mm. consensus building, that's something that you want to do, but you're also talking about sort of tinkering is not going to work. That sort of suggests that you want to, you, you want to sort of bring about quite radical change, but how do you sort of marry those two together about bringing consensus but bringing that change you want to see? Because you know, governments change. Yeah. And how do you ensure that? that the things that you want to build to transform the same place. So I just want to be really clear that that consensus building that I aspire to do is not an abstract thing. It's something that I've amply demonstrated in the last six years. For example, to my understanding, my Election Access Fund Act, first drafted by Mojo Mathers, a former Green MP and someone also who I admire a lot, uh, it's the first Green Party members bill that passed through all stages with complete consensus. And I negotiated with the Honourable Nick Smith in order to get that through. So too I've worked across the aisle in the Environment Select Committee and in Finance and Expenditure Select Committee with our now new Minister of Finance. 
but I've also managed to consistently remain clear on what Green Party values are and the things that we're aiming to achieve. So I think the difference here, or rather what I'm hoping to bring, is not only that ability to work across the aisle, but also to mobilise our communities to bring about that stronger mandate for change. Because that's where this place gets its legitimacy from. Can you Are you going to out what happens yeah. next? Sorry, Jason? Can you walk us through what happens next mm -hmm. over the next couple of months? Obviously, the announcement won't be until March 10th, so you're going to be going out lobbying various different branches. Mm -hmm. What's your plan? So, uh, nomination's close on uh, Wednesday the 14th of February, Valentine's Day, uh, if any of you would like to put yourselves forward. Uh, and thereafter, we will see on Friday the 16th of February that candidate information and ballot papers are sent out to our branches all across the country. Uh, then we have some uh, uh, policy conference and a range of party-wide Zoom calls so that there's the opportunity for party members to engage uh, with myself and any other candidates who choose to put themselves forward. Uh, then we have the period for branches to hold their internal discussions. Uh, and ballot papers from those branches will be returned uh, on Friday the 8th of March by 12 noon. Uh, and then we will see that a new co-leader will be elected, obviously with that democratic mandate, on Sunday the 10th of March. And are you expecting a challenge from within caucus or maybe even without, outside caucus? Look, I have said that I have spoken to all of my caucus party colleagues, but I'm not going to divulge the content of those private conversations. Uh, when it comes to the Green Party and members out there, you know, we've got thousands of members, and I think many of the press gallery have, uh, you know, pointed out quite amply that we're not always super predictable, but we are incredibly democratic when it comes to those processes. So at this point, I couldn't tell you what's on other people's minds. What I can tell you is that I'm here to represent my communities. My community has asked me to stand up, and that's what I'm doing today. Are you going to outshine Chris Hipp? and become kind of de facto leader of the opposition? Look, I've said that I believe that the Green Party are the leading voice of the parliamentary left and the political left, and it is our job as the Greens to continue to mobilise our communities to stand against the declared cruel agenda of this government. You know, they have announced their intention to reopen oil and gas drilling in Maui dolphin habitats. You know, you've got the Honourable Shane Jones saying that he wants to mine uh, our conservation estate. We have to, as the Green Party, stand against that cruelty and that decimation of people and planet. You're prepared for the... Do you see you and Martin McCarran the party to the 2026 election? Uh, look, that is absolutely my intention as declared today, and it's what I understand that Martin has also put forward. Talk to your seat platform, what sort of um, platform would you stand for as co-leader? Are you going to be specifically looking at drug reform, um, climate change, what would you be progressing? I think you can look at hints uh, and what I've been up to over the last six years. Uh, I am incredibly interested, obviously, uh, in confronting the challenge of climate change uh, and climate action, particularly as I highlighted in my introductory remarks, we saw the impact of that in our largest city in Palm Dakota, Auckland at the beginning of last year. So climate continues to be a central focus, as does equality. And I think to the debate that we've been having in the chamber over the last few days, it's been mind-numbing to consistently hear particularly members of the government say that they want a more productive society without looking at the elephant in the room, which of course is our tax system. And obviously, I spent the last election, as the election before that, making the clear case for the need for tax reform. Because unless we do that, we are not going to confront a tax system that sees the top 311 families in this country holding more wealth combined than the bottom 2.5 million New Zealanders. That's not a mistake. That is a political decision that remains in place to this day. Are you prepared for the added scrutiny that comes with the job? You guys tell me what that'll look like and I'll tell you. <laughs> Just following up on Jason's earlier questions, uh, noting maybe not about you, but is your goal that uh, you want to bring about a Green Prime Minister? We want to bring about the lead. I see within the Green Party the potential and the capacity for leading government. That's my point. My point is that we are not a party of tinkering. We are a party of transformation. And when I talk to members of our community up and down this country, I hear and I see very clearly immense frustration were tinkering when they were promised transformation. Only the Greens can be trusted to continue to push for and to win concrete gains on that necessary transformation. We have never been willing to compromise our values on that. So Labour aren't going hard enough. You, you know, you've been talking about how you're not here to tinker. The Greens are the voice of the progressive left and the Labour no longer the voice of the left. I'm not here to speak on behalf of the Labour Party, but I am here to tell you that I felt, as I said, throughout the 2023 election, 
that I felt very, very strongly as the many members of our community that the rhetoric of transformation was met with a reality of tinkering, and that is not good enough. There is a reason that I am a member of the Green Party of Aotearoa New Zealand, because we represent the now necessarily radical transformation. Surely that's a reflection on the Labour Party in mm -hmm. itself, though, isn't it? Sure. So you don't think Labour's up to it? Um, sorry, Benedict? So you don't think Labour's up to it? I'm in the Greens because I believe in our kaupapa, I believe in our people, and I believe in our capacity to organise and to mobilise to get the necessary radical change across the line. You have yet to hold a ministerial portfolio. If you were to make a Greens government, would there be any you're interested in? Look, that is ultimately a matter for our caucus and whatever kind of negotiating space that we're in at that point in time, how the numbers fall and otherwise. What I can tell you is that over the next three years, I will be focused, should I have uh, the privilege per our party membership and the upcoming vote, that I will be working with the Honourable Marama Davidson to build our movement to get us into a position where we have the capacity to negotiate for that government. James called himself a pragmatic idealist. Mm -hmm. Are you an activist or...? Pragmatist. I mean, I guess we all have to define ourselves, don't we? That's why I put forward that I believe that I am a well-researched radical. Uh, I also believe that I could absolutely um, have that uh, label of pragmatism attributed to me, um, as I've amply demonstrated in my many legislative and regulatory achievements over the last few years. Just on a lighter note, what would Cody to Chloe mean for boomers? <laughs> Uh, Benedict, I have never repeated that terminology since actually, funnily enough, uh, I was heckled by Todd Muller, who then obviously was the uh, climate change spokesperson for the National Party, during a reading on the Zero Carbon Act, where I was making the point that we have thousands, tens of thousands of young people Rangatahi, across our country mobilising in the streets, and they weren't being heard by those who occupied positions of power. Uh, so I hope uh, to continue to do what I have done over the last few years, which is to unify people and to work towards intergenerational necessary change. If you uh, become co leader, would you want the climate change portfolio that James used to hold? How important is it for everyone to have that one? Uh, so I can say that it's pretty clear, based on the work that I've done over the past few years, and for example, the Environment Select Committee, um, Mark, you of all in the press gallery will probably uh, be across the uh, Zero Carbon Act, uh, the disseminating view, uh, rather the minority view that I put in uh, during the Select Committee stage there, where I made a really clear case for us to not only have the Independent Climate Change Commission, but for it to, it to have a status more like the Reserve Bank, that is to require uh, kind of binding uh, targets to be put on the government when it comes to those climate budgets. Uh, so I'm a nerd and a policy wonk when it comes to the detail of this stuff. Uh, and I'm really, really passionate about it. But those conversations will be for caucus. The Reserve Bank is independent. Are you sure you could have you know, the willpower to be hands off when there's an institution like that making the decision? You're talking about the Independent Climate Change Commission. Mm. Uh, well, I mean, the, the model that I was speaking to is that the Reserve Bank, as I put forward in that uh, minority view, uh, occupies a position of effectively being seen by many politicians, obviously, to hold their expertise external to the politics of the day. My case in that Environment Select Committee minority view was that we should see the Independent Climate Change Commission holding a similar status to the Reserve Bank, still being independent, but being able to say that this is the window that politicians must operate within. Do you, think, do you mean like legislatively independent, i.e. it goes through Parliament, or just don't touch it as a sort of a matter of a rule of thumb? Well, yes, I believe that it should be independent. That's that's the point. Again, if we're looking to get into the policy detail of this stuff, more than happy to have an offhand with you, Jason. It's pretty well documented about the uh, views that women especially get in Parliament. Um, a lot of green MPs have been experiencing that views as a leader. What would you do to try and tackle that? It's a really good question. It's one, um, if I'm honest with you, I've been reflecting on a lot uh, over the last few days. Uh, but obviously, uh, in light of events over the last few months and years, uh, I think that... The abuse that parliamentarians are subjected to, especially women and especially women of colour, is something not only for one individual party leader or co-leader, uh, but also something for members of the press gallery and something for all members of this institution of parliament to reflect upon. I have been quite concerned by the direction of travel that I've seen in the past month alone where we have seen that what once might have been considered conspiracy fringe theories are put to members of parliament as legitimate questions and then legitimised in the form of clickbait headlines. That then takes those theories and that harassment into a space of legitimacy and mainstream. And I think that that's something which, again, all of us have to hold responsibility for. And reflection is all well and good, but we do have some of the most powerful people mm -hmm. in this building. 
do you think there should be something politically done about this? Oh, there needs to be so much more leadership in this space, absolutely. And I think that there is the opportunity for greater consensus, or at the very least discussion, on what it is that our parliamentary leaders can do here. Yeah. Can, 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 can you give examples of those um, some conspiracy questions that you've seen in the last month that you've seen legitimised? Uh, yeah, I can tell you that on Monday I was asked about something which had been circulating Twitter, which was demonstrably untrue, and then uh, transcended into a mainstream media headline and resulted in a lot more abuse in my inbox. Can you give us a bit of a timeline in terms of when exactly you decided to throw your hat in the ring? I mean, it's no secret that James Shaw wasn't going to you know, mm. stick around. Had you been thinking before he announced his resignation that you would put your hand up? No. <laughs> I can say uh, that, you know, look, again, as I've said before, I am not going to divulge uh, private conversations. Um, James himself has always been really clear about the fact that uh, he wanted to take us into the government and safely out the other side. Uh, reflecting on the commentary from the press gallery and members of the media over the past few days, everybody's kind of said that per those statements from James in the past, that this kind of came as no surprise. Uh, but ultimately, the point uh, for me is that I have spent the last few days speaking to members of my community, speaking to my family, speaking to my friends, speaking to caucus colleagues, and it's become abundantly clear that the time is now. Is there actually... Right. In, terms of, in, terms of those, in, in terms of those conversations with... Was that kind of um, just following up from what Anna was talking about? Well, part of that discussion, did you consider the potential increase in abuse that you could face if you take on get elected? Yeah, it was. Yeah, Friday. Um, just in, following on Anna's point, uh, do you see there being any space for more protections for MDs? I, I take the point that you know needs more leadership in the space to change sort of social um, mm -hmm. dis discourse about these issues, but do you think that you can do more to protect parliamentarians or at least your MDs? Yeah, I think uh, that this is a nuanced discussion because when we're talking about measures that we may undertake in order to protect parliamentarians, one thing that I'm concerned about is that we err more towards separation from the accessibility that I've always really valued about the way that our democracy operates. I would far prefer that our leaders use their cultural capital and their position of leadership to be really clear about the behaviour that they expect and to model that behaviour as well. So I think that there is a balance that needs to be struck to that effect, uh, but ultimately that that starts with leadership in this place. Is there actually anyone within the Green Party that is actually brave enough to take you on, given you know your profile? <laughs> I mean, if you're a member of the Green Party, come on, let's do it. Uh, look, I just, I, I love our party. Um, you know, when I first came to the Greens, uh, I was not promised um, any position, and to be perfectly honest with you, I didn't necessarily expect that I'd get into Parliament. Obviously, I joined um, off the back of the 2016 local body election. Uh, and felt as though I didn't want to waste the privilege of the platform that came with that campaign. Uh, I think that all members uh, across the party should spend the next week reflecting on the kind of leadership, or co-leadership rather, that they want to see uh, in our party, leading us not only through the 2026 election, uh, but also, as I alluded to in my introductory remarks, through the 2025 local body election, because there's an opportunity there to grow uh, leadership and capacity within our party. So, yeah, it's up to the members, and we love democracy around these parts. Cool. Thank you all so much.